Hello, I'm Terry David Mulligan, and this is Mulligan Stew, the podcast, music, film, food, and wine. And I promise there is a wine story coming, and I'm just gathering up the last interviews to go into it. We're also going to be doing a bit of a special on Winnipeg singer-songwriters. There's something going on there. I mean, it's being led by people like the Landreth Brothers and Joey Landreth, Carly Dow, wonderful singer-songwriter Carly Dow, and her friend and fellow singer-songwriter Madeline Roger. I'm stalking a blues singer Sue Foley, and I'm zeroing in on two Christmas interviews because they both have Christmas albums coming out, Serena Ryder and White Horse. Anyway, all of that aside, our guest this week is Tom Wilson, the singer, the songwriter, the artist, and the author. It's more the author that we're going to examine. I mean, the music world knows about Tom through Blackie and the Rodeo Kings and Junk House, uh, his group Lee Harvey Osmond, his old group Florida Razors. But it's the book that got my attention. Beautiful Scars, Steel Town Secrets, Mohawk Skywalkers, and The Road Home. And it was Tom trying to find the answers to the question, basic question, who am I? Where did I come from? He was raised in Steeltown, Hamilton, Ontario, tough town. And he fell in with World War II vets, factory workers, his parents, Bunny and George. He noticed that there were no baby pictures of him. And for years, he lived in the shadows, kind of wondering where he had come from. Until somebody in the front seat of a car that he was in the back seat said the fact that he had been adopted and that he was, in fact, Mohawk. But I tell you what, he is an incredible storyteller. And this is an outstanding story. He's truthful. He's blunt, as he always is. And yes, it's a story about scars, but it's more than that. It's about discovering your own truth and then how you deal with it. Please enjoy this conversation with Tom Wilson. Hello, Tom. How are you, Terry? Very well, sir. Um, have you done the, the uh, are, you, are you now an, an author? Uh, are you going to festivals? Are you reading? Are you... Uh, have you taken on a life other than what you were Yeah, doing? I guess I, I, I'm, I'm happy to be in this world, to tell you the truth, Terry. And, um, you know, I've been in, in kind of the music and the visual art business for years, and there's a lot of rewards and a lot of challenges in that. And I'm sure there's a lot of challenges in the book publishing business, too, and in the industry. But so far, it's all been shits and giggles to tell you the truth it's wow. been a good time people are really positive uh uh at uh, double day and uh really at this point in my life i just need to be around positive people so yes i am i guess i am author tom wilson now and i uh, <laughs> i go to parties now instead of you know going to parties with uh i don't know you know neil young and hugh dylan i'm going to parties with michael and and john irving so that's kind of, uh, it's thrilling for me because uh, there are people that I never thought would be, you know, I'd, I'd come across in my life, let alone people who were reading my book, too, you know. Oh, my God. They're going to turn you into an icon. Oh, my <laughs> God. Oh, yeah? Icon. <laughs> I, that was never in my job description, but what does that pay, by the way? <laughs> it pays more. You, you, you're, oh, okay, good. Okay, good. Um, I had great fun. Um, reading the story, some of which I knew, much of which I did not know, because we're, you know, we're half a country away, or even more than that. Yeah. And, and I, ha I had a conversation with um, Ani DeFranco yesterday about her book that she's writing now, and I said, what's the most difficult part? She said, memory. I, I can't remember where I was yeah. and what I did. Um, and... Um, Grant Lawrence, on the other hand, when he wrote his book about the smugglers, he had freaking diaries. He had notebooks that he'd stashed away. He knew exactly where he was and what he did. And the other, the guys in the band said, no, we weren't. He said, yes, we were in Japan this month of this year. Huh. So, so where were you in all that? How about this, Terry? I remember, I wrote down what I remembered. Anything I didn't remember, I didn't consider important anyway. How's that? I, I think it makes life a lot easier on you as an artist if you actually tell your story. And I mean, this is this is a job. I mean, I, I'm still working at being an artist, and that job, part of that job entails wiping out all 
the school stuff, all the education, you know, anything that the cops told you while you were sitting in the back of their cruiser, you know, anything that you're told while you're lined up at Walmart, all the rules of, of the planet have to be put aside and you're allowed to make your own rules. And even though 45 years, you know, creating, writing, uh, and and we still face those. You just mentioned Andy DeFranco, who's like unbelievable artist, <laughs> you know, who's still looking for the memory. Right? It's it's the thing is that it's the artist's memory that's different. You know, there's no Fox News or CNN fact checkers uh, on your case. You know, and there shouldn't be because you're telling your story. As a result, um, I'm I'm kind of the last man standing in my story. Yep. And it's up to me to tell, to be the bearer of truth. You exactly. Know? exactly. Basically the lies, the lies that were, were fed to me my entire life in my story. What was the big, um, what was the big lie? It, tell them, tell, tell people about the big lie. Well, the big lie was that, um, the, the, the people who acted as my mother and father were actually my great aunt and uncle. And it was always said to me from the age of four that there's secrets about me that people were going to take to their graves. You know, it made me feel like one of the one of the great mysteries of of all time. You know, it it put a lot of uh, pressure on me, I guess, uh, uh, throughout my life. Um, it also turns out that the woman who's acted as my cousin my entire life ends up being my mother. Um. As well, uh, I grew up thinking that I was a big, sweaty, puffy Irish guy all my <laughs> life, and I'm actually a big, sweaty, puffy Mohawk guy. I grew up an only child, and uh, I met six of my 11 brothers and sisters uh, two summers ago back home on a reserve outside of Montreal called Ganawage. So, um, you know, I'm, I will say this, Terry that I've been 18 years clean and sober. And if I, if this was 19 years ago, I probably, I probably would be a mess, but luckily I'm surrounded by love and stability and sobriety. I have the love of my children and my grandsons. So I know exactly who I am as a man. I am a man, but now I'm a Mohawk man. I was out there jumping fences and screwing the breeze from tour to tour, yep. month after month. And as the miles rolled by, bit by bit, I lost my footing in reality. I came off highways and into the soft centers of towns, banging on my guitar, hissing and moaning through giant speakers. I stumbled off stages, drunk and raging and hiding in the soaking wet blues of the wee hours. I'd just keep going down strange streets, back to my hotel or tour bus where I'd lie and dream of finding a taxi to take me to the airport and fly far away, once and for all, through the dark sky and up through the hole and into the brightest light, and I put my head back and wished I was dead. How yeah. Long, how long did you live in that world? <clears throat> well, you met me in that world, Terry. You met me when you were with uh, much music, you know. Um, that was, that was, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, the, if you're not ready for some of the greatest rewards to come your way in life, um, uh, they can hurt you, you know? And, uh, I was, uh, I guess, I guess for a very short period of time, uh, bombarded with a little bit of notoriety and some kind of minor, minor league fame, you know? And, and it can mess with a person, even though I feel artistically I was ready to take on the world that I had apprenticed. I mean, I got signed to Sony at the age of 33, right? So I was a man. I had two kids, and, uh, and I, was, I was out there swinging for the fences artistically. But what I wasn't ready for was, uh, was being on the road for two and a half years straight pretty well. And I don't think... I don't think that anybody's really ready for that. When, when that, uh, when, when the industry or when a record company pulls that catapult back, n nobody's ready for it to let go, you know, and it got let go. And, uh, my life was not my own. And, uh, I lost, uh, 
lost track of reality in some ways, you know, and I felt like I was actually already dead. That statement that I wanted to die was, I think, I think I wrote that uh, a little prematurely because I actually felt like I was pretty well dead at that point. It's important if you could, can you paint a picture for people who have yet to read this book? And I'm encouraging them to do that. Could you tell them about George and Bunny Wilson? George and Bunny Wilson, uh, well, they were the two most loving people that I'll ever meet on this in this world, you know. They were people that were already broken. They were older. George was blinded in the Second World War. He was a tail gunner and a Lancaster bomber. That's a seat, by the way, that not many, not many of the guys that sat down in that seat in the Second World came home. Yeah, who would and, and, home. and, and who would go willingly into that seat? By the way, an absolute <laughs> only insane people. Wow, I think. And George Wilson wasn't insane, but he was definitely a wild man, and uh, he 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 wanted to take on the world. Uh, he wanted to take on the world. Uh, I think. Uh, a little more, he had a little more dare in him than uh, than most people. Even you know those guys in the Second World War who were all daredevils. He was probably one of the biggest daredevils, sitting back in that seat in the darkness and the blackness, bombs going off around him, flying over France and Germany, and um, you know he never really talked about that. But, yeah, you- um, his his bloodied boots. Uh, sat in the basement of 162 East 36th Street in Hamilton, and I still have his uh, oxygen wow. um, helmet uh, wow. in my bedroom wow. uh, at my house. Uh, so, uh, so who were they? They were people that um, whose whose uh, fingerprints are all over me, you know, inside and out. And uh, as I say, in somewhere in the book, I say that these are people that gave me a fighting chance. You know, I was. I was a guy that uh, spent his first six months of his life in a Catholic uh, nursery orphanage and then another six months to eight months in a foster home. And uh, then they decided to take me in, you know. They decided that they were going to raise me. And that's pretty brave for people in their late 40s, early 50s to be bringing a baby into their house. And uh, like I say, they were damaged people, Terry. They were hurt. The world had already beaten them up. They had been through the Depression, and they had been through a world war together and apart. And they were had their own love story. So for them to extend themselves, um, that was a big deal, man. And, and as I wrote this book, Terry, I hope my answers aren't too long, by the way, but as I wrote this book, Terry, I wrote it with a lot of anger at times, a lot of anger at Bunny Wilson for, for not coming clean with me for not telling me that you know that i was adopted um but in the end you know i i I, it was their their love their love ruled their love led led me through this book and by the conclusion of the book when i read when i wrote that last short chapter i think i think i give it all up to them uh i could probably uh rewrite that chapter now and i could probably keep writing that chapter uh, for the rest of my life, because uh, what I owe them, uh, I, I owe them pretty well everything, you know. George's life, I I could tell that you were big on George because you painted it, the his world was so vivid. You take us back into what post war Canada was like, uh, yeah. uh, especially for a vet who had been left blind and bitter at times, not as bitter yeah. as others, but bitter. Uh, you just painted an incredible picture of post-war and what I remember of post-war Canada. Wow. Yeah. That was a gift, man. I just wasn't prepared for how clear that was. Like it was yesterday. Yeah, it's interesting, huh? Because that was, I mean, and and, and when uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that, Terry, because my, um, my uh, the, the corner of the world that I watched that from um, was mine, like I say. You know what I mean? It's like I wasn't trying to tell. Canada's story. I was just telling my own, but I, I'm really. Uh, this is the first time that anyone said that they related to that and they saw that 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 what the the picture that I painted uh, so clearly. Way to go! Thanks for that. Tell me about Janie. Janie is still uh, 
is still somebody that uh, I drive to church on Sundays when I'm home, and I drive her to Fortino's for groceries once a week. Janie is a matriarch of our family. She sits at the head of the table for uh, all the birthdays, all my kids' birthdays, my grandson's birthdays, uh, for Easter, Christmas, all that stuff. And um, she's kept a secret from me and from the entire family our entire lives, you know. Um, She's, uh, you know, she's broken herself. I think that uh, lies, you know, or holding lies or holding back truths uh, are probably uh, our our greatest enemy to our health physically and mentally. And I think that Jeannie is testament to that. It was, I think you actually, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was a rotten life for a kid. But it was perfect for storytelling and songwriting. Oh, for sure. It fueled me. But I mean, you got to remember, Terry, I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me either. I didn't know. Uh, I battled. I battled uh, figuring out who I was and where I was from all my life. At the age of four, I I suspected that Bunny and George weren't my mom and dad. Um, At the age of 14, I confronted Bunny uh, that uh, that I didn't think that uh, they were my that she was my mom. And, uh, you know, they shut me down pretty quick, you know. Um, I was shut down. So as a result, I walked around with this question mark over my head for, for 53 years until I, I was, uh, until I accidentally stepped into the back of a limousine and a total stranger right. told me that her grandmother was friends with bunny, you know, you got the whole thing spilled out and it was never meant to be. It was just somebody talking to you and all of a sudden, and- yeah, it was a, a handler for, uh, uh for speaking uh, for some speaking engagements I was doing. It was a handler that was, she was uh, assigned to me to get me in the limousine. It's amazing because in most rock and roll, you just get in the car and drive. Well, folk music for sure, but most rock and roll, you got a tour manager. But in, in uh, when you get into the speaking, public speaking <laughs> forum, you get somebody to get you in the limo and get you to the airport and get you to the hotel and then get you to the gig. And, you know, and that's who this woman who was assigned to me her grandmother was friends with Bunny Wilson, and and she kind of, she kind of spilled the beans. She I guess. blurted it out, and then you could, I mean, you, the way you wrote it, you can hear the shock in her voice. She was all of a sudden she realized that she had told you the big secret. Yeah, she had no idea that I didn't know. Who I, would assume? Who would assume that a man fifty three years old would not know? Uh, his heritage or where he was from or the fact that he was adopted. Uh, who would who would suspect that a 53-year-old man that nobody would come to him before that time and say, uh, you know, you should probably know that, uh, you know, you're you're adopted and that you're a Mohawk and that your family is on a reserve in Ganawagi, you know. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't believe, I mean, who would think that a guy 53 years of age would not have, um, you know, cleaned himself up and put on a suit and become a banker? <laughs> I think that that's the biggest mistake anybody can make in their life. <laughs> you don't want to manage the money, Terry. You want to hold on to the money. <laughs> yeah, you want to stash it. Um, now, then you discovered that you were a Mohawk. How much yeah. a Mohawk? You weren't quite sure. But you had to find out right away, didn't you? You had to get to where where the answers were. Well, after I found out that uh, Jeannie was my mother, well, uh, you know, I... I but then, 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 then the mission was really full on. Um, I, I wanted to find out mostly Terry about my health. Um, finding out who of my course. father was, of course, and at the time who my mother was was one thing. I didn't think that that would ever happen for for sure. What I did know is that I had to find out if uh, I was susceptible to becoming a diabetic or Alzheimer's or leukemia or diabetes. You know, I was interested in that. I'm in my 50s. I I wanted to know. I didn't have a mother or father to be able to judge those things off. So I went on a website called 23Me and, to find all that stuff out. Very good source, by the way. And uh, and I got a, a phone call. Or actually, I got a, a, an email through the website from a woman in Montreal who was looking for her grandfather and said, we shared 20, I think it was 23 to 27% DNA. 
and I'm looking for my grandfather, and uh, I think that you might be him. And I said, well, listen, I'm, I got my grandsons are really young, and uh, I'm not your grandfather, but good luck with your search. And she wrote back 24 hours later and said, well, you might not be my grandfather, but we still share 23 to 27% DNA, so that makes you my half-brother. Right. And that led me to a family uh, on the reserve, my father's, basically, uh, my father's side of the family, because she was an illegitimate a uh, child also from uh uh from my father's <laughs> my father's wild ways when you found out you you had all that Mo- mohawk heritage did it explain certain things certain uh certain feelings you had um certain thoughts the way you reacted to people and things in your life uh That's it's a very good question. And some of this, uh, some of these, some about how I felt started to dissolve once I started to find the truth out, you know. It did uh, stop a search. It did, uh, uh, it, it explained why I look the way I do. And I mean, it's funny because I did an interview with McLean's Magazine yesterday, Terry, and this t- subject came up. And it was when I was in grade school, you know, uh, I was called... Uh, you know, hey, you dirty Indian, right? And when I was uh, in high school, uh, I used to be called uh, Yahoo or Wahoo or some some sick kind of term for uh, Native people, you know. And I never really got it. I never even took offense to it. Cause it was like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. Now that I am a Mohawk and I come out saying, you know, well, no, I'm a Mohawk. Uh, you know, people say, hey, really? You really don't look Indian at all. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, okay. Well, you know, so that little that little scenario explains so much about my life because uh, as soon as uh, as soon as I proclaim myself, people don't really buy into it, right? When I didn't know who I was, people were happy to define what I looked like to me, you know. Um, does, uh, does it mean that I'm not like some white guy that is, uh, running, uh, running out to sweat lodges and, uh, and passing around, uh, uh, pipes, you know, and burning sage, uh, you know, I'm not one of those people. I am a Mohawk person, you know, and, uh, and maybe I'm a little more sensitive, uh, about some issues. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, I, I can actually, uh, I, I can say that I'm more sensitive about some things about uh, my heritage. I can also say that uh, I'm uh, I'm letting my culture and I'm letting my heritage come to me, and it's coming to me over time, and it's coming to to me across oceans of time as well. And the Mohawk Nation welcomed you in. Well, my sister likes me. My sisters and brothers are pretty cool with me, you know. Actually, I just called my sister this morning to invite her to our show in Ottawa on Saturday night. And, um, you know, uh, my uncle, uh, my great uncle, uh, always considered me his son anyways. He wanted to raise me, but um, but he didn't get a chance to. So uh, I'm, I'm actually heading back to the reserve uh, next weekend, a week, uh, a week this week to uh, visit family so have you have, uh, i i check in there see how it's going have you talked to robbie robertson about any of this no i i'm supposed to go to uh, a thing out on six nations for robbie uh who was getting um an uh, uh an indigenous uh award for his work with the communities um but instead i uh i took my grandkids out uh to play soccer that afternoon so i actually haven't talked to him um, he's from uh, Six Nations. Uh, his, right. he, his family's from Six Nations outside of, outside of Hamilton. So we're kind of from different. We're both Mohawks, but we're from uh, you know different ends of the 401, let's say. Songwriting. I've, I've had this conversation with a number of other songwriters. Uh, well, Bruce Cooper, for example, about yeah. he, he jumped into it. He loved the whole book thing. It took him three years to get through th- that book of his. Yeah, uh, and he was uh, he about halfway through. He thought, "I'm n- I'm never going to write a song again because I've cleaned out the tank. There's no thoughts. There's no I've got nothing to fall back on." Yeah, and then he and then he was asked to do a a, a, 
uh, a, a contribute to an album, and he decided to do an Al Purdy. He wrote a, a song about Al Purdy that that broke open the dam, and he was off and running again. I was just wondering about the exercise of actually the discipline of writing the book. Is it like songwriting? Were you able to do that? Um, it's more like writing a seventy thousand word love letter. To tell you the truth, yeah. Uh, unlike songwriting, where you know you can get away with a with a really great rhyme, <laughs> and and uh, uh, you know that kind of covers that little section of it. You, you're not really relying that in in book writing, you know. Mind you, I I didn't try to. But I did. Uh, I did manage to tell this story with a certain amount of poetry uh, in, injected into it. You and, know, and you did that, man. That was great. Yeah, it was important for me to do that, and I didn't want it to be. Uh, I didn't want it to be a chronicle or or a stiff document, because the story to me and my life to me was, is not a stiff document by any means, you know, nobody's life is a stiff document. So I really didn't want to, I didn't want to write the, uh, I didn't want to write a book like I was a politician or, uh, you know, some kind of corporate guy or some kind of clergy clergyman, you know what I mean? I wanted to write it as an artist. And, and I think that, uh, to represent myself, in a book, I'd have to be uh, representing myself uh, as what I am achieving, exactly. trying to achieve in this life, which exactly. is trying to be an artist. Exactly. I mean, you're pretty tough on yourself, actually. You call it, you weren't hiding on yourself. No. No. Um, uh, there, what's the point? You know, uh, I do feel uh, I do feel like I basically am showing my ass to uh, to everybody. It freaks me out. I, I lie awake at night thinking, oh my God, what have I done? Not for my sake, but for my mother's sake, uh, for, you know, all the spirits out there um, that are around me, all the ghosts uh, Hmm. that are around me. I feel, uh, I hope that I, I hope that I, I hope that I've respected everybody, Terry. How did it show itself in your songwriting, this, this knowledge, this, this, um, full circle as it were realizing that you had a family and they were there and this is who you were how did it show itself in the songwriting well i i i uh it's it's more of an ingrained stamp uh it's more uh, like a brand how's this it's like uh, a fresh brand or a new tattoo i guess um I, I, now I'm now I'm constantly aware of 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 where where I'm from and who and the people that that I come from. Uh, uh, am I going to uh, put that? You know, am I going to get vanity plates with that on it? No, I'm not. I'm not also going to put that uh, at the front of everything that I write about or or my that I want to express artistically. Uh, it's funny. And this is another long goddamn answer for you, but I've been writing about <laughs> I've been writing about native conflicts, and I've been writing about uh, the Six Nations uh, for the last five years with Lee Harvey Osmond. In fact, I've joked that Lee Harvey Osmond is a band that writes songs um, about addiction, uh, native land rights, uh, you know, and and, uh, and insane asylum. So we're going to the top of the charts. I don't think that's going to change. <laughs> I'm, uh, I've been writing about uh, native issues for for the last eight years, so I guess that things are still going to creep in there. Yep. Well, that's another that's another outlet for you as well. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is I see this reference to um, Neil Young. I know that you, you when you started to you want to pick up a guitar and you wanted to be a songwriter. You you looked at Gord, you know Lightfoot because he was the guy and and, and, yeah. and, and others. And uh, but Neil, what was the song? Was it Old Man? What was the song that that uh, wormed its way into your brain? Well. It was a whole album, Tonight's the Night, yep. that opened up the doors of possibilities to me as an artist. It's funny because um, he was just put into the Canadian Songwriters the Hall of Fame, and I was asked to read that passage to him at Massey Hall, which was my first public reading, was at Massey Hall for 2,800 people, and for Neil Young in yep. particular. Um, but what he did was that the, opening that door of possibilities. You know, it's not necessarily... Um, uh, technical musicianship that uh, inspires 
guys like me to want to play music. Uh, Neil Young's Tonight's the Night inspired me the same way the Ramones did years later, the same way punk rock allowed thousands of people to start expressing themselves without having to play like Kansas or the Eagles, you know, or do it, do it yourself or, or yeah. yes, you know, all you needed to do was know three chords, three chords and have, have something to say, which by the way is what, what folk music is, you know, you describe uh, Tom Wilson, by the way, uh, this is our speed round. The, you describe the band. We, we, we both love, everybody loves the band the, you describe yeah. the band was the sound of freedom. Was it yep. was it Cripple Creek or Unfaithful Servant or something like that? Wow, so so good because I I think I bought a single, I think Rag Mama Rag and the flip side was Unfaithful oh, Servant. So, yeah, but it was uh, the, I think that the freedom the freedom that I initially heard was that uh, that these guys will do are doing whatever they want to do obviously because this the record when I dropped the needle on Rag Mama Rag <laughs> it was like I had to go and check it as a kid to see if it was warped. And then I thought, this is like music that's getting that, that's in 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 sideshow mirrors. You know those funny mirrors that sure. distort your body. Sure, it was like country and rock and roll. Uh, it was like carnival music that you know was all distorted. I'd never heard anything like that before, and I came to a very fast conclusion at the age of twelve that these guys are doing whatever they want. These guys are are real artists. I just think the come full circle is the fact that uh, Robbie Robertson, who was writing a lot and influenced a lot of those tunes, was a Mohawk brother. He just didn't know it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I didn't even know it. No, nobody knew it. It's there's a there's a bumper sticker out there that probably says "Music can save you," but I believe in the healing power of music. I I absolutely tr- I've seen it. We've all seen it. Did it save you? And is it pos- yeah. and is it possible that there's someone out there that's listening to this now that you could say something about the healing power of music that worked for you and may work for them? Oh, geez, you know, music moves us usually in the right direction. I mean, over the years, Terry, holy God, I've had guys in Saskatchewan come up and say, "Hey, man, I got thrown into solitary because I wrote the lyrics to a junk house song all over my." <laughs> <laughs> my prison cell walls and it's like well I'm sorry you had to do that you know <laughs> um yeah music you know what music and we're gonna find out as we get older you know that somebody is gonna stick a set of headphones on us and it's gonna be a rebirth for us you know we're gonna be able to connect ourselves with who we were i stood on stage with john mann and watched him dance through an entire show with Spirit of the West. He got up on stage with me. He didn't speak into a microphone or sing a word, but the power of music moved him in such a beautiful way that night that uh, it's it's a testament to to the power of what it is that we try to try to do when we make music and what we try to achieve in satisfaction when we listen to it. Thank you for your beautiful scars. The music. And and uh, and you and and for surviving yourself, and the book. It's a great read. I would highly recommend. Don't. Well, read it. I read mine. At, yeah. At three o'clock in the morning. Because because yeah. I thought it was a three a.m. book. Uh, and, yeah. And then I would go back to sleep, which meant it's not that scary. But there's some re- very revealing things here, and I thank you for your time, Tom. Thanks, Terry. I'm going to go do sound check now. Thank you, man. Hold okay, on. buddy, we'll see you soon. Many thanks to my friend Tom Wilson for talking to me and taking time, opening up his heart to all of us. If you want to give a book this Christmas to someone who you really like, like they have to be prepared for this, check out Tom Wilson's book, Beautiful Scars, Steel Town Secrets, Mohawk Skywalkers, and The Road Home. And listen for the music that's coming your way from Tom Wilson and Blackie and the Rodeo Kings and whoever else he falls in with, like... Lee Harvey Osmond. Thank you for listening. I'm Terry David Mulligan. This is Mulligan Stew, the podcast. Please subscribe on Spotify, Google Play Music, and Apple Podcasts. And one more thought, just around this time of year, Remembrance Day, please never forget those who gave their lives, those who fought, those who came home, and especially those who didn't.